Welcome back to the Miraculous Mamas podcast. We have an amazing bonus episode this week, and it is with Danny Kilgore, who is joining us to share her story of pregnancy, motherhood, overcoming um, issues with the healthcare system, and um, just sharing her strength <laughs> and faith with us as well, and uh, also how she's partnered with the March of Dimes to help spread awareness to women to get the information that they need to learn how to advocate for themselves and to learn how to um, plan for pregnancy, to plan for motherhood, to learn how to be the healthiest that you can to help support your pregnancy uh, and to help everyone learn that there is access to this information out there. Uh, I cannot wait for you guys to hear her story. So we're going to jump right into it. All right, everyone. I have Danny Kilgore here with us today, and I'm super excited for her to be sharing her story. She's been through so much. I was watching the YouTube video of you before, and I was just tearing up hearing everything that you've been through. You're such a strong mama. And um, I just want to thank you for taking time to share your story and sharing your energy with us here today. Um, She also is going to speak to us a little bit about March of Dimes and how they help families out as well. So thank you so much for being here, Danny. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Elizabeth. Yeah, I would love for you just to start telling us um, who you are and to share your story with us. Yeah, so um, like you said, I'm Danny Kilgore. Um, I am a pastor here out in um, the Bay Area of California. So um, I guess, you know, I, I'm a Southern girl. We've only lived here two and a half years. I feel like I'm a Cali girl, but I'm still Southern girl, heart and heart, you know, through and through. My husband and I and my daughter, who's five, we moved from Atlanta uh, two and a half years ago, almost three years, and we've been here ever since. And so, um, we are um, here in the Bay Area, and um, yeah, it's been really cool. My husband and I have been married for 11 years, and um, throughout that 11 years, we have uh, we have one daughter. She's five. She was born in 2015, but um, from the beginning of our marriage, we have experienced what we call a faith journey towards parenthood. Um, it has not been an easy road. It has been one that... Um, had some ups and downs, more more downs than ups, but definitely an amazing up through our daughter. Um, in 2009, my husband and I got married, uh, November of 2009. And then February of 2010, I found out that I was pregnant. And we were really young. We were in our 20s. We got married at 25. And um, we I had just started teaching. So I was an elementary school teacher. My husband was working for our church. And so, you know, we like to say we had very humble salaries. <laughs> so, you know, being a new being newlyweds and having these two humble salaries and then finding out, you know, only a few months after you're married, you're pregnant was like, ah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. We wanted a little bit more time. And so I was not, you know, I, you know, I tell people, you know, I was not excited. I was like nervous because I'm thinking about life. Meanwhile, my husband is from a family of eight. And so he's like, already like, yes, let's get it. Let's go. (laughs) You know? And so it was through his, his excitement and his encouragement that I stopped, you know, thinking about, you know, 20 years from that point and stayed in the moment. And I got excited too. And then when we went to our first doctor's appointment and me hearing, uh, you know, our baby's heartbeat, I mean, it just changed everything for me. And so I was really excited and I was enjoying the idea of being a mom. But then six weeks in, six and a half, almost seven weeks in, um, I found out that I miscarried. My, um, made the baby inside of me stopped growing. And that was really devastating. Because I got to a point where, oh, no, I'm not really excited about being pre- being a mom. Then I'm like, oh, no, I am excited about being a mom. Then to go, okay, well, actually, I'm not going to be a mom. Mm-hmm. And that was really hard. I mean, and, and on top of that, because my body did not, you know, uh, go through the process of ending the pregnancy, I had to have um, a DNC to go in and remove the baby. And so it was, that was devastating. That was traumatic for me because, Mm -hmm. you know, you're, 
you're you're going through a process of formally saying you're no longer pregnant. Mm-hmm. And it was it was hard. It was really hard. And so um, that was in 2010. And so my husband and I decided that we will wait. Let's wait. And so um, we waited um, on family planning. We decided to, you know, focus on just he and I. And so and we, we did that for three years. And so in 2013, we decided, okay, let's try again. We're ready. And so in 2013, um, I got pregnant. And it was it was great. I mean, my doctor at that time when in 2010 said he he you know very casually I he she very casually like brushed it off like oh it happens more often than you would think it's you know trust me it's it's very common you're you it's it's fine just really um, you know emotionally disconnected to that idea that I had lost because because as a doctor. Mm-hmm. she was giving me statistics of how often this happens. So you don't be worried. So in 2013, I got pregnant again. I'm still in my twenties and I'm fairly young and I mean, I'm fairly young. I'm healthy. I was uh, still a teacher, but I was also a soccer coach. So I was exercising and doing things like that. And so, you know, there was no reason for me to think that anything would happen. Um, Especially because my doctor said, "Oh, a lot of women's first first pregnancies result in a miscarriage." And so, um, 2013, we we're pregnant. I found out I was having a boy, and we decided to name him after my husband. So he's William Jr. And we were really excited. I said, like, oh, "I'm going to be a, a, a it's a mom of a son, and it's going to be so exciting." And so um, we just went on and, and was really excited about becoming parents. Um, Around 20 weeks, though, um, I started spotting and having some bleeding. And so I went to the doctors and, you know, they checked and, you know, my son was was fine. Um, They ran some tests and they came back and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And so they just told me to, you know, try to take it easy, just mindful of, you know, any strenuous activities and things like that. And so that was at 20 weeks and we just left it um, alone. We decided that, okay, well, Lord, we're just going to trust you. And so we kept going and, you know, going through the pregnancy around 23 weeks, though, I started to wake up with these severe headaches like for a week straight. I had these headaches, like massive headaches. I was seeing spots. I was getting dizzy. Um, I didn't know what was going on. And, you know, I would call the doctor. They would ask me to go check my blood pressure. Every time I would check it, it would be extremely high, higher than what it, would sh- it should be. Like it would it would creep up from the 130s to the 140s and then back to the 130s. And I, I, didn't, I didn't have high blood pressure uh, prior to um, these moments. And so um, and they would tell me to sleep for a few days and, you know, I mean, you know, be bed rest for a few days, things like that. One day, I, you know, by the end of the week, like it was on a Friday, I just couldn't take it. I mean, the headaches were massive. And, you know, when you're pregnant, you can't take anything to make the headaches go away. So I'm just in extreme pain. And so my husband said, let's go to the doctor. Like, we need to go. Something's not right. And, I, you know, I, I felt like something wasn't right either. My mother taught me very early on that, you know, your body gives you signs when something's wrong. And so to pay attention to your body. And as a mother, a mother to be, you really need to pay attention to the signs and mm-hmm. what happens in your body. Because you're not just paying attention to what's happening for your body. You're having, you're paying attention to the signs for your baby as well. And so I, I you know, I, I remember my mother telling me that. And so I, we were like, yes, we're going to the doctor's office. So we went. My doctor was not there. They were not willing to take me back. Like they were like, oh, I think you'll be okay. You'll be fine. Maybe just go lay down, you know? And I'm like, no, I was very adamant. Mm -hmm. I I, I like to say I I became aggressively adamant because at at this point, no one's listening to me. They're treating me like a like, you know, a, a, a mother that is is not in her right mind. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, oh, you're fine. It's not that. And, and I'm telling them that, no, something is wrong. And it wasn't until I told the nurses I was not leaving until I was to be seen by a doctor. It didn't have to be my doctor. That she left, went back, and got a doctor. And the doctor said, okay, fine, just bring her back. And it was, really, again, it was very nonchalant, very uh, dismissive. And so when I went back, 
the nurse, like they always do, she checked my blood pressure. And she said, oh. And she left, came back with the doctor. The doctor checked the blood pressure. And he says, okay, Miss Kilgore, I'll be right back. I need to go make a phone call. And so he goes, makes the phone call. About 15 minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, he comes back. And he says, okay, I need you to go straight to the hospital. Do not go back home. Go straight to the hospital. I will meet you there. When we get to the hospital, we get checked in, we get in our room, and he comes in. He tells us that I'm, I have preeclampsia. My blood pressure was 156 over 107. It was extremely mm-hmm. high. Mm-hmm. And he said, you're going to have to stay in the hospital until you reach full term. Now, mind you, I said I'm 23 weeks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is a long time to be in the hospital to get to 40 weeks. And he's like, yes, we, we don't know. We we're, And he was very honest. He said, I'm not sure how far along you're going, how far you'll get. But we need to get you. Uh, we, you need to stay here until then because he explained to me what preeclampsia was and how, you know, uh, that affects the ba- the life of the baby and that if they're not careful, it can turn to eclampsia, which can be fatal mm-hmm. for both myself and my child. Mm-hmm. And so at 23 weeks, I had settled into the hospital for that to be my new home <laughs> for the next 20 weeks or so or 17 weeks. And so... We, we, we stayed there, um, but at 28 weeks, it was in the evening, it was late at night, the nurse woke me up and she said that she was noticing something on the monitors and that she needed to call the doctor. And so she called the doctor, the doctor came in, checked some things. They took me, they sent me downstairs to a like ultrasound, did an ultrasound, found out that um, my, my son's heart rate had dropped um, significantly. My placenta had completely stopped working and it was no longer um, accepting blood and sending it to the doc- to my son and that they had to do an emergency C-section. And so at 28 weeks, um, they did an emergency C-section. I had to get what they call a classical cesarean, which is when they do a vertical incision versus a horizontal incision. And... Um, it was later that I found out through another doctor that the reason why they did it was because of his size, was because my blood pressure was extremely high, and because of his heart rate was so low. And that was the best way they could get him out, the best and easiest, fastest way to get him out without causing any stress on either one, any further stress on either myself or my son. He was born September 19, 2013, five days after my, my birthday. And um, he was born one ounce less than a pound. (laughs) He was in the NICU. Um, You know, they discovered that his lungs were extremely underdeveloped. Um, They couldn't keep, he couldn't um, keep them inflated so that he could breathe on his own, so that he can breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. When he would breathe in, one would collapse. When he would breathe out, one would collapse. It, It was so that he was on a breathing machine. And I remember being in the NICU, watching and looking at all of the things that it took to keep him him alive, to keep his life sustainable. That naturally happens on the inside of a woman. Um, all of the things that is just naturally in in us. And I I was just looking at childbirth from the eyes of a miracle at that point. It's like wow, this is a miracle that this is happening. This is a miracle that babies can. Um, live within me and then I'm looking outside in the NICU and I see all of these things that's trying to keep him alive. Um, so we're going back and forth to the NICU. We lived about 45 minutes away from the hospital. And so we were taking some long drives back and forth every day. Um, I ended up um, stepping down from being a teacher so that I could spend more time with him. And so um my um, my husband and I were, so it got to the point where my husband was working and I was just going back and forth as often as I could. And he would come, you know, after work and things like that. Um, and we got to a point though, where he was starting to grow. He was getting bigger. I was pumping milk so that he could have milk to eat. Um, to Yeah, he could have uh, milk to eat. I was told that because he was born prematurely, my body naturally made a certain type of milk 
for premature babies. I was, mm. I did not know that. I was like, really? They said, oh yeah, the breast milk from a mother who gives birth to a premature baby is very different than that of a mother who gives a, a birth to a um, a full term baby. And so we need you to pump milk. So I was like a like a cow. I was pumping like <laughs> nonstop. But <laughs> it was like constant. Like we bought a deep freezer for the amount of milk I was pumping <laughs> for my <laughs> for my son. And it, and we thought he was he was getting bigger. He's opening his eyes. I mean, he was responding to our voices. Like it, he had gotten off of the breathing machine at one point. He was on he was on two breathing machines, and so he was off of the one that kept his lungs um, inflated because he was able to expand them on his own. And they were he was getting bitter. He mean getting better, and so we were really excited. But then he got um, pneumonia, hmm. and. Um, they were able to clear the infection and they put him back on the, um, they put him back on the breathing machine just for, you know, just for protection, just to keep his, so he wouldn't have to work as hard. And then he was starting to come out around from that. But then October 31st, I mean, I think the weather started to change, you know, different people coming in and out of, you know, touching him or holding him, things like that. I, you know, he, he got pneumonia again on October 31st. And I think that second time he got pneumonia is what, um, kind of, is what caused him to lose his fight, I should say. Um, he, he, he could not recover from that. He could not, it, he, they were having a hard time um, getting him to breathe on his own. They put him back on the uh, the the breathing machine, the oscillator. And as they, as he would try to uh, breathe, they had to increase its power because it just wasn't, it just wasn't enough. Um, he, they had to resuscitate him a couple of times to bring him back as a result of all the things that he was going through. And then um, there was on November 8th, he just, they could not bring him back. And so um, on November 8th, 2013, he passed away and it was really hard. Um, it was hard mostly because it wasn't what we were, ex- it's not what you expect. And, you know, you, it was nothing you could prepare for. Um, you know, when you think about the perceived natural order of things, you, you prepare yourself that one day your parents will pass away. You prepare yourself that one day your spouse will, you know, will pass away. You prepare yourself in a, as much as you can. You know that that will happen, that your grandparents will pass away. But when you're children, that's not something that you you can perceive as being normal. That's not something that you could ever... It, it's like I said, it's not the natural order of things. And so it was extremely hard. Um, it was hard. You know, the doctors were very... Uh, our doctors, we had two great doctors and, uh, for, for our, um, our son had two amazing doctors and they were both very, very, uh, challenged. You could see they're emotionally, um, moved by his passing and doctors don't usually show their emotions in front of their patients for good reason. But, um, and one of our doctors, he just was to the side and he had turned really red. And my husband took him to the side and he, my husband shared with me that he was saying that we were rooting for you too. We were rooting for you too. You guys had such great spirits and you came in such, you know, we, it, it, I, we don't, we were trying everything we could. You all just really were a, a family that we had never experienced before. We never experienced, we don't experience many families like you all. And 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 you know for me that was that that helped a little bit at the moment that you know ours being there was um you know wasn't in vain but i was still sad <laughs> you know my son is not here my son died and it was it was challenging you know like i said you know our, we i'm a pastor so our faith um it's a really strong aspect of who we are but um i would be remiss to not mention that that was a turning point for us. That was a moment where we had to come face to face of what we say we believe and what's happening. And it was, it was hard, but it was because we had a strong um, church family. 
We had great family and friends that helped support us. Um, I, I went through therapy and had group therapy and things like that. My husband and I did group therapy together that we were able to um, start to uh, find some sense of healing. And then from that, you know, me sharing that it happened to me or people finding out that it happened to me, more people started to tell me or more women started to come to me and tell me, oh, yes, this happened to me, too. Oh, yes, I experienced this. Yeah, I had a stillborn, stillbirth. Oh, yeah, my son or my daughter um, died pre- as, as a result of premature birth or, or I actually had, you know, this many miscarriages and things like that. And I was trying to figure out why was this happening so often. And then for me, the common denominator was um, all of these women talking to me were African-American. And I couldn't, I, and that was when it was hard for me to put uh, answers to these questions. Like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Why are all these, why is this happening so often to women? And why is this happening so often to African-American women? So then I started to do research and I'm Googling things and I'm trying to figure out what, what I'm, I'm Googling. Why is this happening? Why do African-American moms die? I mean, um, moms have premature births and things like that. And it was something that I Googled that led me to March of Dimes. And on March of Dimes were these articles that gave all the statistics about um, the disparities and the lack of access to health care for, you know, women of color and specifically African-American mothers and things like that, and how this was a thing. And that the the numbers of uh, the, the statistics around this disparity were extremely high. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't my case. Right. I had access to health care. Mm-hmm. You know, I I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't living in an impoverished neighborhood. You know, my husband and I were, were, uh, we had humble salaries, but we had salaries. Like we were, we were take we were making, uh, making wet by. So why was this happening to me then? Mm-hmm. And the only thing that I could connect was that there are, there is systemic racism within our healthcare system as it mm-hmm. pertains to women of color. Yeah. And how I, you know, I connected back to how I was treated mm-hmm. and how I was dismissed and how I wasn't taken seriously. And had I not been so adamant, what would have happened to me or my son mm-hmm. had we just went back home? Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that from that point, it was my hope and my goal to make March of Dimes a part of my story so that I could let more people know about what's happening, so that more people could ask questions, so more people could find answers. And in hopes that the more people, the more women of color that ask these questions, that start to be more admin, or for women to hear this story and know that they have rights, that they can advocate for themselves too. Um, And so, you know, from that point on, we started a March of Dimes team, and we would walk, and I would share my story. We would walk and we share my story. And I would have opportunities to talk to different um, women and things like that about what would happen, what was happening, and what happened with me and my son. Um, 2014, I got pregnant again, but then I miscarried. I think at that point, my husband and I decided that maybe it was best for us to start to see what it was like to either... Uh, be a family of two and what, how, you know, maybe that's something that we need to explore or what would it look like if we were to adopt? Um, it was so much, it was just too much up and down, devastation, disappointment, hope, and then devastation. It was too much that was connecting to that, that we were like, maybe we should just, let, let's just focus on us and see what, you know, life between just you and I would look like. And maybe, you know, if it's God's will, we'll explore, um, we'll explore adoption. And so that was where we were. We, we had stopped trying and we were just, you know, going to move on from there. And then we took a vacation in 2015. We took a vacation and, um, I, it came, well, actually, I think we took a vacation around the end of the year or something like that. I can't remember, but we took a vacation to Las Vegas. And, you know, the saying, everything that happens in Vegas stays in Vegas mm-hmm. is not always true. <laughs> <laughs> 
that is not true because we came back pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> Like, wait a minute, they lied to us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Vegas should help us raise this child. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe not. I'm just kidding. We don't want Vegas to raise our child. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um yeah, but yeah, so we went and we found out I was pregnant and there was a lot of anxiety around this pregnancy because of where we had been, um, what our story had been. And I was just kind of nervous. But um, I um, was recommended a doctor because I had Kaiser insurance at this point. I was with a private doctor's office prior to. And now at this point, because I'm working in a different school system, we have Kaiser. And my friend told me about her doctor from Kaiser. And she said, you should, you know, um, you choose this one. And it was a doctor of color. And the first thing that I... I, that this doctor said when I went into um, his office was he looked at my chart and he said, Ms. Kilgore, uh, as I'm looking at your chart, I see that you've experienced a lot of devastations. You've experienced a lot of losses. And I want to say, I am so sorry for that. I am so sorry that you've experienced that. I'm so sorry. How are you doing? Hmm. That, that, that took me by surprise. That took me off guard. I didn't really know how to answer it at that moment. I had to kind of, well, you know, I had to think about it because I wasn't expecting him to say that. I wasn't expecting him to lead with his humanness. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting him to see me as a person. I was expecting him to see me as chart number one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't expecting him to connect to the loss, the hurt that I that I'm, I mean, it was still very new. You know, my son died in 2013. It's 2015. You know, it's only two years in between. And so in him, he he wants to connect to how am I doing on the inside before we even address pregnancy. And, you know, I'm pretty sure my other doctor had, my other doctor, they, she knew what was happening. The other doctor knew, the, my other male doctor, he knew what had happened. But they never connected to that side. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was really big. And they, he went on to, to share with me a care plan. And he gave me options. And my husband was a part of this. And he talked to us about what this would look like. And, you know, the difference in C-sections and were you aware why you had the C-section? He's the doctor that told me why they would have done it. They didn't tell me why they did the type of cesarean that they did or the implications behind that as a result of that, now you can no longer have a VBAC mm. because of uterine rupturing and things like that. And he shared with me these things. And he said, well, I'm sorry. He said, I apologize that this information wasn't given to you then. But if I may, I'd like to offer it to you now mm-hmm. for what it's worth. It's, it's I, you know, and I can only say that it was because I had a doctor that looked like me who saw me for me. Mm-hmm. He saw he saw me as someone worth caring about. And my experience, you know, I was at a doctor's office, you know, almost every week. Um, I, I had a, a, I'm a prenatal chiropractor who helped me in that instance as well. I mean, I had, I, I had doctors and who she was also a, 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 a doctor of color. It, I just had a different experience, you know, as an African-American woman, having African-American doctors, my experience was that much more rich. It it felt more um, like the type of healthcare that everyone should have. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I went on and my daughter was born prematurely still as well, but that was by choice, by the doctor. It was a shared choice. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, after a, um, at a doctor's appointment, him checking her heart rate and how she responds to different things, he noticed that compared to the week before, her she didn't respond as quickly as she did the last week. And so in his mind, he said, I think we might be at the beginning points of preeclampsia again. And he said, we could move it to another week and we could play it by week or we could go ahead and, and schedule a cesarean now. And it, you know, it... 
it will be just fine. She may be in the NICU for a couple of weeks, but where, you know, all of her major organs and things like that are well developed. It's 35 weeks. But I want, he said, this is just what I'm recommending. I'm going to step out of the, out. he's, I'm going to step out and I want to give you and your husband a t- some moment to think about this. And you tell me what you want to do. They, he put the power in our hands mm-hmm. when other doctors, they took it. They didn't even tell us we had any. And I just, I, you know, this is a part of sharing and sharing my story. It's, it's not just me sharing that, gosh, I've experienced so many losses in my journey of faith. But I didn't just experience loss of, of, of children. I experienced the loss of advocacy for healthcare. I experienced loss of having a health provider that would give me the type of care that I needed, me, Danny, needed, not the type of care that a woman in her 20s having this many, like it was a cookie cutter um, care that was given. It wasn't curated specifically for me. And these doctors did just that. And so, um, you know, my daughter was born at 35 weeks. And um, as a result, she was born with a um, hearing loss. So she has sensory neural hearing loss. She wears bilateral hearing aids. But she is five. She is reading. She loves to talk and sing and dance. And she's in kindergarten. And she loves all things pink and pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she is um, hands down, you know, you if you go, it's like she is um, she's she's a, she's like the, the girl that loves tutus and fun and she likes to explore. And she is definitely a miracle for us. She's a living miracle. And, you know, out of all of the things that we've experienced, all of the things that we've gone through to get to her, you know, I tell people, you know, five years ago. I couldn't imagine my life with her, but now I couldn't imagine my life without her. Like Mm -hmm. she has changed our life in so much. And um, yeah, and I can't help but to say it's because of the type of care that we had, the type of care. And, and, you know, it could have, it could have happened the same way Mm -hmm. as my son. That, that is not, um, unrealistic that that could have happened again, but I think had it happened, I think I would have had, based off of the doctors that I had, I think my experience would have been different Mm -hmm. because it was different. And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I am, I'm grateful for March of Dimes because they started the, they started me on this path of knowing, started me on this path of understanding that, hey, you have rights. Mm -hmm. If anything, March of Dimes tells parents, tells mamas, they have rights. And they give them, you know, statistics behind that. And they help you to find your own story. And on top of that, with me having uh, my son, my son's death, they took, they helped me to see my story, not as a story of sadness or as a story of, you know, um, despair and things like that. But it was a story. It's a story of hope. It's a story of courage. It's a story of strength. Like these parents that have experienced this, you are strong. You have gone through something that not many have. And we are a part of a sorority slash fraternity of, of, of um, we're in a sisterhood, we're in a brotherhood. And they allow us to, to stand with each other and to celebrate our stories, but then also give us the space to remember and honor as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Since we're talking about March of Dimes, I want to take this time to kind of dive into some of their initiatives. And for 2021, um, the month of January is National Birth Defects Prevention Month. And the March of Dimes wants to help spread awareness of what you can do to help prevent birth defects. Um, They believe that whatever is best for you and best for baby is something to... um, follow and to share. You can look it up on Instagram um, or whatever social media platform you're on. Hashtag best for you, best for baby with the number four. Um, Protecting yourself and making healthy choices are so important now more than ever for those who are trying to get pregnant in 2021. 
As we continue facing the COVID-19 pandemic, pregnant persons must take special care of themselves as they prepare for their baby. While there's still tons to learn, there is research that shows that pregnant persons might have a higher risk of severe illness or death from COVID-19 compared with non-pregnant people. This new year, which begins with National Birth Defects Prevention Month in January and is followed by World Birth Defects Day on March 3rd, is the perfect time to learn about the actions that you can take to be healthy before and during your pregnancy because what's best for you is best for baby. Understanding birth defects and their causes is an important step in pregnancy um, and preparing for pregnancy and having a healthy baby. Birth defects affect one in every 33 babies born in the U.S. each year, according to the CDC. Birth defects are structural changes that affect one or more parts of the body. So the heart, brain, foot, uh, they develop most during the first three months of pregnancy when a baby's organs are forming and can cause serious problems in overall health, how the body develops and functions. Common birth defects include congenital heart defects, cleft lip and left palate and spinal bifida. Um, your genetics, behaviors, and social environmental factors can all impact the risks for birth defects, and not all birth defects can be prevented. But we do know that you can adopt certain behaviors to increase your chances of having a healthy full-term pregnancy and baby. And here are six tips to follow. One, protect yourself from COVID-19. Stay safe. Help prevent the spread of COVID-19 by wearing a mask and practicing social distancing. Remember to check for the new guidance from the CDC to keep you and your family safe. While we still have more to learn about COVID and its impact on pregnancy and babies, uh, current research shows that during pregnancy, you may have a higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Additionally, while current research does not show a direct link to COVID-19 and birth defects, fevers in early pregnancy may be linked to birth defects. Number two, make sure that you are taking 400 micrograms of folic acid every single day. Folic acid is a B vitamin that is proven to prevent some major birth defects of the baby's brain and spine. So before coming pregnant and during pregnancy, take a multivitamin containing 400 micrograms of folic acid every single day to ensure your baby's proper development. Eat foods that contain folate, the natural form of folic acid, such as lentils, green leafy vegetables, black beans, orange juice. Eat foods that are um, from fortified grain products that have folic acid added, such as um, some breads and cereals, foods made from fortified corn, massa flour, um, such as cornbread, corn, corn tortillas, tacos, and tamales. Look for folic acid in the product label. Be sure to check the nutrient fact labels and look for a product that has 100% next to the folate. Get a pre-pregnancy checkup. See your healthcare provider to talk about managing your health conditions and creating a treatment plan before you get pregnant. Speak to them about all the prescriptions or over-the-counter medications that you take, vitamins, supplements. Um, get a pregnancy, a pre-pregnancy checkup, even if you're if you are have already had a baby, your health may have changed since you were last pregnant. Number four, stay up to date on vaccines, including the flu shot. Speak to your healthcare provider about what vaccines you need during each pregnancy to help protect yourself and your baby against serious disease. Number five, before you get pregnant, try to reach a healthy weight. Excess weight can affect your fertility and during pregnancy, obesity can increase the risk of having a baby born with a defect and other complications. Talk to your healthcare providers about how to get to a healthy weight before getting pregnant and maintain a healthy lifestyle that includes eating healthy foods and regular physical activity. Number six, boost your health by avoiding substances that are harmful during pregnancy. There's no known safe amount of alcohol during pregnancy or when trying to get pregnant. Alcohol can cause problems for a development for developing baby throughout pregnancy. So it's important to stop drinking when you start trying to get pregnant. If you or someone you know uh, has a substance abuse disorder, talk to your healthcare provider or call the National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 4357. Also, smoking causes cancer, heart disease, and other major health issues. Smoking during pregnancy can also harm the developing baby and can cause certain birth defects. Quit smoking. Quitting smoking will help you feel better and provide a healthier environment for your baby. 
Opioid use in pregnancy can lead to neonatal abstinence syndrome and premature birth and may cause birth defects. Women should consult their physician before stopping or changing any prescribed medication. Join the conversation about National Birth Defects Prevention Month by following hashtag best for you, best for baby on social media and by visiting the March of Dimes at marchofdimes.org or nasersano.com and the cdc.gov slash birth defects. March of Dimes, the leading nonprofit fighting for the health of all moms and babies, is observing National Birth Defects Prevention Month in January 2021, and this is an annual event in which March of Dimes partners with the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention to generate awareness among women of childbearing age and families about actions that they can take to help prevent birth defects. Uh, Well, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for sharing all of that because... (laughs) Um, I mean, you've been through so much and just listening, um, as, as a woman of faith, I feel like how it's amazing that you like had people around you that helped you with that, but it's like, man, it it just had to have been so shaken, you know, in those moments because it's like, okay, (laughs) you know, I feel like, yeah, (laughs) just being like, okay, how, how, you know, and, and just kind of, Mm -hmm you give and take away, but you know, how am I supposed to turn to you in those like takeaway moments? And um, man, just for you to like stay rooted in your faith Mm -hmm. is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm sure, like you said, you had people around you helping you Mm -hmm. through Mm -hmm. that. Um, Yeah. Also touching on the systemic racism, I feel like that that um, as a birth doula, it's something that I had studied and learned about as well. Um, but a lot of areas don't experience it because they are white. And Mm -hmm. um, when you were sharing your story, just from the beginning, when you're like, I called them and and was saying like, I had this really bad headache and they're like, oh, just try to rest. I, my mind was like, no, like why, why weren't they like, (laughs) Hey, okay. Like, you know, how long has this been going on? We need to see you. Like, why, Mm -hmm. why was this not happening? And it's so Mm -hmm. infuriating that you weren't given the care that you Mm -hmm. needed. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and that, that does happen so much more in the black population and the native American population. Um, Mm -hmm. and that does contribute to the maternal death crisis that we have in America. Um, and, and so I love that you were speaking out about it and touching on Mm -hmm. it. Um, but I would also like to know like how, Like, as a white woman, how can I help amplify that? It's it's nice that now there. It like this is the first time ever that it's actually being politically talked about. um, Yeah, which there's like hope for change. Then, like, okay, you're talking about it now. Let's put things into action to correct this, to fix it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's still so many people that don't know about it, don't experience it. Mm -hmm. but it still needs to be talked about. Yeah. 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 I would say, you know, there's a lot of training that needs to happen within those that are in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a training that happens. I'm pretty sure with, um, you know, understanding, you know, patient care and bedside manner and things like that. But there are cultural, like not all situations can be contextualized, you know, some things have to be culturalized. <laughs> so, some, what happens in one context cannot go, cannot be, you know, applied across the board. Some things can, but there are times when you have to take in consideration, you know, a person's environment, a person's, you know, and I believe that I, for, in my heart, I believe that doctors know that. Mm-hmm. They know that. But there's somewhere down the line where that becomes less of a priority and to, and, and to see, you know, okay, woman in her 20s, um, experienced one miscarriage, experienced this, oh, that's probably nothing. Versus, okay, woman in her 20s who's African-American, who lives in the city, who lives, well, okay, what other things could add to this um, issue? Or, you know, things like that. Like, I think that... That that's one thing. There needs to be more training and understanding of 
cultural differences and cultural situations and that culture and ethnicity actually does play a part in one's health, one's health care. But not on the sense, so not, not always on the case that, oh, she probably just has high blood pressure. She's African-American. Well, that's not always the case. I don't have high blood pressure, but you can't just put me in the box of having high blood pressure because a lot of African statistics have shown that a lot of African Americans have high blood pressure. Like that's that just because that's a statistic for some, that's not a statistic all, Mm -hmm. you know, I I just think that that that's one thing. I also feel like um, the, the being willing to listen is what you're already doing, right? You're willing to listen and you're willing to use your platform for more people to hear. Um, I have a friend that's a doctor and she and I um, talk about uh, things all the time. And she says herself, I appreciate you bringing this to my my attention because I don't, I actually don't have that many African-American patients because of where her practice is. And so because of that, that doesn't, it doesn't automatically come to her forefront. She doesn't Mm -hmm. automatically think that way. But just because you don't interact with or you don't have that many patients that fit this criteria, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't always be aware. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be always learning and growing in that aspect. Um, There just needs to be a lot more cultural competency training in so many different areas, but Mm -hmm. specifically in the healthcare system. And and to help them tear down stereotypes. You know, I I you know, I can't help but to say that, you know, I was being seen as the stereotypical or or the mythical angry black woman, mm-hmm. right? That they're oh she's just oh she's just being angry. She's just being mean. She's just uh that's just how they are. That's how I was being treated. I wasn't being treated as someone who actually was bringing up valid points. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, you as a woman that's in healthcare, you're listening to this. And then you yourself, as you notice those types of things, you can speak up mm-hmm. for that. You can speak up against that. Like even you saying like, no, that's not what they should have said. What they should have said was this, this, and this. Um, another thing is, you know, individuals willing to go into communities and, and, and get, tell them what their rights are. It, you know, educate, you know, different communities of people of what their rights are, having more opportunities to share, having more opportunities to learn. I, I think that that was the biggest thing. You know, the Bible says my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And my, my son perished because I didn't have knowledge. I didn't know. Now, mm-hmm. could it have, could something have been different? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I was at a deficit in knowledge because I didn't know. I didn't know anything about preeclampsia. I didn't know about um, the type of cesarean. I didn't know what to look. I had no clue. And had I had a doctor that shared with me and told me these things, or had I had um, nerd, you know, um, a class or something that could have given me more information, I would have been more prepared. I would have been more aware. I would have known more. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just, I I definitely think that being those that have the knowledge, being willing to share it with those that don't so that we all can have the knowledge of some form. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, I'm going to have the knowledge that you do that you have over your many years of experience and education you've gone through, but you can at least that, you know, doc- physicians and people in healthcare can at least give you the basic knowledge that you need to know that you have the rights for this. Mm-hmm. You as the mom, you as the dad, it's in your hands. And as your healthcare providers, we're providing you with this information so that you can make the best decision possible. And um, I think that 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 is key. Knowledge, mm-hmm. knowledge, giving mm-hmm. moms and dads the knowledge that they need so that they can pursue the best healthcare for themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I always like to remind people too, like that your healthcare provider works for you. Like you're in, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of times, like the situation that you felt, it was almost like you were working for them, you know, and right. that's, that's not it at all. There definitely needs to be way more education, individualized care 
and mm-hmm. um and knowing that that you can if you have not everyone has the option to change doctors depending on where they're at depending on what insurance right. will cover um right. which that you know should change because if you're in a situation where you can't advocate for yourself with your provider, you should Mm -hmm. have the option to have another provider. Right. Right. So just, yeah, I just want to thank you so much for sharing all of that because I mean, you've been again through so much and, and for you to, to, um, you know, you were saying earlier that it, that it wasn't in vain and, and just to see that, um, is amazing. Uh, I would Uh, love before, before we end, um, just to touch on a little bit more of the March of Dimes, like what's, I know you said like you did some walks with them um, and they help Mm -hmm. educate people on their rights. Um, Like when would somebody reach out to them or go to their website or Google them at what point? Yeah, I think that um, anyone who, who has a heart for moms, if you are a mom, if you're thinking about becoming a mom, if you know a mom, I think, <laughs> I think anyone who believes in healthy moms, healthy babies should um, go to the marchofdimes.org website. Um, it's worth being aware, educating yourself, um, knowing what's, what, what, what it means to be a healthy mom and healthy baby. What does that actually look like? And you can help your neighbor, you can help your friend, you can help your sister, your daughter, whoever. And I think it's worth going to a March of Dimes website whenever. But if you are a mom who is a mom to be, the March of Dimes um, does help um, give you information on how to be a healthy mom. It gives you tips on how to be, to, to maintain a healthy pregnancy. And so um, that's definitely one of the places you go. Then, you know, if you yourself have experienced a pregnancy loss of any type, you know, that's also a place it's, you know, it's like a, like a, 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 like a sanctuary. <laughs> you can go to March of Dimes and that's where the walks come in because you get to be a part of a community. It's, it's hard when you think that you're alone in this. It's hard when you think that you're off, you're in an island by yourself. And March of Dimes has done a great job of providing community. And the walks is one of those places where you can find community. Um, They have Facebook groups. They have um, um, Instagram pages where it, you know, you can find your tribe and you can find a place where you can share your story, hear other, get advice, you know, and it won't feel like you are uh, weird. You know, it, it, you can't have these types of conversations with everyone about, you know, I can't, in the beginning, I couldn't talk about my son dying or, you know, how I felt or, you know, my, me remembering holding his hand or holding him after he passed away, me having him. Like, that's weird for some people. Like, oh, that's kind of, you know, they don't know how to handle that. But to be in a community with people that are like, oh, yes, I remember that too. And, oh, I still have my son's blanket. Like, you, you, it's, it's a place where you can find community. And so I encourage um, anyone, any, any of those places to go to the March of Dimes website because you will find, you will find community. You'll find tips on how to um, be a healthy mom, healthy baby. You'll find, you know, resources, how, how you can support a mom to be or a mom who's experienced loss of someone. And then in my case, you find answers to questions or at least it directs you in a path to find more questions, more answers to some of your questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, where can people connect with you at? Oh, yeah. So um, if you want to connect with me, my Instagram is Danny K D A N I K. The number four days, Danny K for days nice. <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> and then on Instagram, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, Instagram. And then on Facebook, it's Danielle Kilgore. It's my, my first name is Danielle. I just go by Danny. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I just want to thank you again for coming on and for sharing your story and, um, and for sharing your journey with the March of Dimes. And it's so awesome to see where you're at with your daughter. Oh my gosh. Mm. She's five. <laughs> Yeah, she's five. Oh my gosh. Such a fun age. Yeah, you just wait. You're going to have tutus all over your house soon too. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Probably. I know my mom's already like trying to buy them. My mom's like, oh my gosh, here's the frilliest little outfit. I'm like, mom, she's going to fit in it for a day. Don't get it. 
<laughs> it's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> but probably. That's true. Yeah. But it, yeah, <laughs> we have, um, my nieces are, are that way for sure. It's so much fun though. Um, but again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your energy with us and uh, where people can connect with you and all about the March of Dimes. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Elizabeth. It was so great talking with Danny. I just really am grateful for her sharing everything that she's been through and um, her faith, her struggles, and um, even diving a little bit into the systemic racism in our healthcare system, which is very much pres- present. Uh, And I I hope to talk more of that in some future episodes as well. Make sure that you connect with her. Check out marchofdimes.org. It's a great resource for women who are thinking about getting pregnant, becoming pregnant, or if they have faced anything um, throughout that involves pregnancy. There is a community there that you can link up with and that you can be a part of and you don't have to go through any of this alone. I love you guys and I'll talk to you.